Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. All right, welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and joining me, as always, the warden of Nassau County, it's John. John, you said something to me off air that is not very John-like. Optimism. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. I guess the world is coming to an end. You're optimistic that next year we're going to get the winds of winter. I'm going to say sometime between June and October we're going to get winds of winter. You're, you're saying this just based off... No facts. <laughs> no facts. It's just a gut <laughs> feeling. <laughs> Yeah, could it very possibly be that he's just decided the past couple of years to take more time with it, slow it down purposely, and just release it after the show ends? Because if it does come out Mm -hmm. this year after the show, it's going to make it look kind of obvious that he did it that way. Just let the show have its way. Why go up against it? Right. Well, it would have been optimal for him, obviously. To release this book before the television material catches up with the published material. But that's that ship has sailed two years over two years now, right? Yeah, there was no way he was gonna get the books done before the show was done. There's just no way. No, no. So with that in mind, you and I thought for a while, like, all right, at least if he can get gets the winds of winter out, well. But he's not doing that either. So does it make sense for him to just not release the books at all until the show is finished and then continue on his way. Is that what you think he's doing? I don't want to say he's intentionally doing it, but it's sure it's looking that way. Yeah, that's how it's ending up. Especially if now it doesn't come out in 2019 and we wait another year, then it's just obvious that's not the case. But it just, it would feel quite, what's the word, coincidental that all of a sudden the book (laughs) comes out, you know, three weeks after the show ends. Yeah. Would that be best for him at this point, three weeks after the show ends? Or do you think maybe wait six months after the show ends? A little bit of a a buffer between the end of the show. The publishing company has to think about their sales. And at one point, you could release it whenever, and it would have been on the New York Times bestseller list, and it would have sold more than A Dance with Dragons, A Feast of Crows. That's what I'm thinking, like October of next year, right before the holidays, What would be really funny is if all of a sudden the book is released. If we go by the April 14th, that's the day I'm assuming Mm -hmm. that season 8's going to start. And it ends May 19th. How funny would it be if the book was released May 21st? (laughs) Like, two days after. I had this book done for three years! (laughs) Oh, two days after after the show ends. Yeah. Do you think it's... No. No. I'm giving this guy too much credit. I'm giving this guy way too much credit. I was going to say, do you think that maybe HBO has something to do with why the wait for this book has been so long? Like, does it it benefit HBO for The Winds of Winter to not have been published? But I don't think it makes a difference. You know what? I think it does. I'm not The way I'm thinking about it right now, I just thought about it before. Maybe this was a a, uh, collaborative decision. Say, listen, George, at this point, or where we are at, just publish the book after the show's over. Maybe in the show's looking at it is if the book comes out before the the ending, you might turn off even some more hardcore book readers that at that point won't want to watch the final. This gives the book readers something to see now. You know, it gives them something. Where if you put that book out, that people will say, well, might as well wait four more years for the Dream of Spring and finish it up. It could be a collaborative decision. I think you said it on our last episode. You implied, or you came out right and said that HBO wants him to publish Fire and Blood immediately for material for their prequel series. Mm -hmm. I I just read that from someone's Twitter account. I didn't. Yeah, it's not like an official, obviously. George Martin's contract with HBO is not. Right. It wasn't one of his blogs or anything like one on one interview or anything like that. It was just something I saw on Twitter. It wasn't commentary on a New York football giant's loss. 
or uh, yeah, exactly. Right. Got to take for a grain of salt. It's not like it's it's kind of like Wikipedia. You know, Wikipedia is the greatest thing ever. Anyone, anyone could say whatever they want. <laughs> so you know, you're getting the best possible information. <laughs> I just watched The Haunting of Hill House. I saw that. I didn't see it, but I saw it on the... Uh... Well, the reason I bring it up on our A Song by Song oh, no. Game, of Thrones, Game of Thrones podcast, you know who is top billing in there. Oh, no. Who is it? Dario Naharis, number two. Oh, okay. I really like this show, but that guy is a cold fish of an actor. I have no idea how he gets any work. He was good as Dario Naharis. But everything else I've seen him in, he's just like like a stick in the mud. He's boring, and I don't, I don't know. I, I really, yeah. I really wasn't into his performance. But it, it just could fit the roles that they want. So they, I don't know. Yeah. I said, what, what, what's that movie I watched with him? With uh, the guy who was in the movie Devil, that awesome, amazing character actor. Oh, John Carroll Lynch, uh, The Imitation. I love John. I love John Carroll Lynch. God, he's awesome. Yeah, he's really good. Yeah, John Carroll Lynch is a good actor. Great actor in my eyes. Yeah, you know, I just he just plays those little roles. Yep. You know he was he was, he was great in uh, Zodiac. Yeah. Um, yeah. Did you watch Did you watch The Founder? Yeah, uh, he was really good in The Founder. Yep. Ah, uh, uh, great movie. Makes you pissed off. I think Michael Keaton. Man, he just he played that role so awesome. Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton yeah. Like, what, a, what a sleaze ball to do to do that. Michael Keaton needs another big movie. I feel like his renaissance is kind of hitting a stutter step. He had the Birdman, which was perfect for him, even though I, I didn't like that movie too much. Fits with, with his past role of, of Bruce Wayne uh, and Batman. Mm-hmm. Was it The Founder and then Spider-Man? Yeah, it's The Founder and then it was Spider-Man. Did you see Spider-Man Homecoming yet? No, I didn't see oh, it. Oh, dude. I'm horrible at Marvel movies. I'm, I don't know why. There's a whole bunch of them I haven't seen for some reason. I still haven't seen the first Captain America. It's all right. I mean, compared with the second two, it's, it's you know, night and day. But it's like an action-adventure I don't know if you saw Wonder Woman, but it's, it's kind of like that. Like, it's it's fun. It was directed by Joe Johnson, who did uh, Jurassic Park 3 and I think the first Jumanji movie. Or it's just, It really just works as a lead-in to the first Avengers movie. Right. Speaking of which, we got to get something soon with Avengers 4. I keep on hearing the title is going to be Annihilation. I keep on hearing that Adam Warlock's going to be in it. Or... What's the guy? Um, I forgot his name. The other villain that that eats of the uh, planets. Oh, Galactus. Galactus. Well, I don't. I don't think Galactus will be in it because he's he falls under the Fantastic Four property, which Disney will own. I think the deal just went through. We're still going through. So the movie's done filming. So I don't. I don't think it's going to be Galactus. If anything, maybe they could do like a teaser with Galactus. And then as far as Adam Warlock, he was the main protagonist in the Infinity Gauntlet comic book series back in the 90s, but the whole thing with Guardians of the Galaxy 3 and James Gunn, I, I don't know if they're going to put him into the second Avengers movie. I think, if anything, Captain Marvel will kind of function as that role in Avengers 4. But I have heard that there's another villain, Thanos. Not that he's going to take a backseat in the fourth movie, but there'll be a bigger cosmic entity. What do they call those things? A, a celestial. There'll be a celestial villain. Mm-hmm. That line between like what falls under Fantastic Four and what falls under properties that Marvel Studios and Disney can use is real thin. And some Celestials, Galactus, I'm not sure who else, but I know some Celestials fall under Fantastic Four. I believe in the Infinity Gauntlet comic book, it was the Celestial Infinity who he encompasses like everything. Is Infinity or Eternity? I forget the guy's name, but whatever. But he he ends up with Adam Warlock defeating Thanos by showing Thanos that, yeah, he can control life and death in the universe, but he could be more. He can become infinity. And I think he does for a moment, and that's how they get the gauntlet away from him. Actually, if I remember correctly, then Gamora, no, not Gamora, the sister, Nebula, she gets the, she gets the gauntlet, and they got to defeat her real quick. I don't think they're going to do that in the movie. I don't like the name Avengers Annihilation either. Avengers 4 Annihilation. It sounds like a video game. Prepare yourself for annihilation. It should be like Avengers Assemble or, you know, something a little more. Avengers Unity type, yeah. you know. Annihilation just seems way too, I don't know. Avengers 4 Armageddon. <laughs> <laughs> there was one other, uh, obviously, possible spoilers for the Avengers movies. Avengers 4 Last Man Standing. <laughs> 
the Spider-Man movie, the new the sequel finished filming. And yeah, because that's going to start up right after. Yeah, that starts what they're calling Phase 4, but I don't think they're going to have the phases anymore. I think it's all going to be different after Avengers 4, but what's her face is in Spider-Man Far From Home, um, Gwyneth Paltrow. So I guess she survives Avengers 4. Right. There's been those rumors of an Iron Man suit for Gwyneth Paltrow. There's a character in the comic books that calls herself Ironheart. In the comic book, she's like a young black girl who's really, really smart, like Tony Stark. Mm-hmm. And I guess Tony Stark, I don't know if he died. There's Tony Stark AI. I, I don't know. I can't keep up with the, with those storylines. But maybe she's doing that. But I've also heard that there's a funeral scene in Spider-Man Far From Home for Tony Stark and Steve Rogers. It's like you kind of know it's going to happen because yeah. you just know it's going to happen. But it's kind of like really a like, <laughs> spoiler. By the way, I'm psyched for it. It's incredible how they got that many characters in that in that mm-hmm. much time. It flowed. There was no downtime, and nothing was really glossed over either. It's not like it just went from action scene to action scene to action scene. All these movies established this universe, so you don't have to spend any time setting up the universe. You know the universe already, and you know what? As a good segue to Game of Thrones and these prequel series, I feel like part of the allure of Game of Thrones and A Song of Ice and Fire is the world building itself. Especially when we talk about the TV adaptation, season six, season one, those are our favorite seasons. Season six, because all of these storylines that have been building through the five seasons, they kind of culminate in season six and it starts the, the last third of this story. Season one works so well because of the world building. It's our introduction to Westeros. And Westeros is such a unique place. And these characters are so unique. You think about the journey to the Vale of Arryn and the Sky Cells and little Robert Arryn, King's Landing and learning what the hand of the king, you know, just all your introductions to the series and to things that we take for granted now. The world building itself, even in the books, discovering new ideas and and new places. That's what makes Westeros George R. R. Martin's story so good. So I feel like in regards to a prequel series, we already know about Westeros, we already know about Essos, we already know about the noble houses and how the Seven Kingdoms function. I think it'll be kind of difficult for any prequel series to come close to the success that Game of Thrones has. I agree. Pretty much like start over again a little bit in, in an introduction and all that, which I'm sure they can do. I mean, I'm sure they can tell a good story. Yeah, I'm sure they can also, but you don't want to go and establish Westeros again because you've already done that in Game of Thrones. So for people that have watched Game of Thrones, they don't want to see the history of House Stark. You're getting that in Game of Thrones, in bits and pieces. What's tricky about a prequel series in general? And I I don't know why franchises keep doing this. We've talked about the Star Wars prequels before. At this point in my life, I think they're great. But at the same time, one of the main reasons that they didn't work as well as they should is because we know what eventually happens. We know the outcome. It's like watching the Titanic movie. The ship's going to sink. They're not going to change that. What are the stakes, ultimately, if you know how the story ends up? Even if it's years and years and years later. In the case of a Game of Thrones prequel series, centuries later, you still know what is going to eventually happen. And if you're building up, which they are, to the final series of Game of Thrones and this battle with the White Walkers and the Night's King, we're going to see the outcome of that. So how are you making stakes that are any bigger than that confrontation? Shows stick around too long. Stories are told for too long. We're looking at that with the Star Wars sequel trilogy. Like the story's been told and now you're going back to it to tell more of the story when the best part of that story, it's already been told. It's myth. It's part of lore. And then, well, to do what they did makes no sense. Yeah, a lot of stuff's going on with the episode nine. The old me would click on every YouTube thing that there is. I don't know if they're clickbait type videos, you know, but J.J. Abrams said maybe at this point it's like... Jesus Christ. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> just, get the, just get the dartboard out and I'll just start doing anything, I guess, at this point. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to throw everything at the wall. Palpatine coming back. Yeah. What the hell? Here's one of the fans I really going to appreciate. Jar Jar. You know what? I'd love to see Jar Jar. Honestly, I, l- I would love Could you love imagine? That. Could you imagine <laughs> opening night? <laughs> throw the wedding movie in. And then on the planet. And all of a sudden, Misa, Josh, how thanks. Misa, I'd like to help you. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, dude. Ray returns to whatever the fuck that was. Actung was the planet that Luke was on. Luke's Force Ghost. 
And Luke, <laughs> Luke like, gets real scared. He's like, oh, my God. One true power is coming or whatever. It's a me. <laughs> 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 oh, man, I would stand up and cheer. <laughs> it's the only way you're fixing the series. Jar Jar Binks is the true Sith Lord. Going back to the beginning, The Winds of Winter, I don't know if it's going to come out in 2019. I know that George Martin said, Fire and Blood Part 1, The Winds of Winter, Fire and Blood Part 2. History would tell us that it's going to be more like Fire and Blood Part 1, four-year wait, Fire and Blood Part 2, and then maybe he'll he'll work on The Winds of Winter. <laughs> and the she rolls in Winterfell. <laughs> yeah, which I, you know, I'm sure we'll get one day. But we're basing this on an artist named Enrique Jimenez Coromines, an artist and illustrator known among other things, for creating the covers for the Spanish editions of George R. Martin's A Song of Ice and Fire novels. See, I thought he did the the covers for the editions that are currently in release in North America for A Song of Ice and Fire. They're pretty simplistic, but I think it's a dragon's head for Game of Thrones and then crown for A Clash of Kings, I think a helmet for Storm of Swords. I thought it was whoever made those. Regardless, they sent out a tweet, Enrique Coromines, and he sent it in Spanish, Que queda entre nosotros, pero acabo de terminar una portada para un libro de George R. R. Martin speaking, which roughly translated reads, This stays between us, but I just finished a cover for a book by George R. R. Martin. So immediately people jumped to the conclusion, and the headlines on Google News was, The cover for Winds of Winter is finished. This guy could be talking about Fire and Blood. Right. I guess somebody questioned that, and he sent another tweet that said, it's not for Fire and Blood. So, is it The Winds of Winter? Is it another Wild Cards book? Is it, you know, a new edition of The Ice Dragon or some other baloney that George R. R. Martin's trying to capitalize on? I don't know. But it's been a long time, man. It's going to go on eight years. And, and to think that he had, like, a quarter of the story finished when A Dance with Dragons was mm-hmm. uh, was published. I think that he, I think he wrote a lot and then I think he went back and rewrote a lot because he got new ideas and then he has to go back and change what he's written. He had the idea for a twist on a character that came organically. So he had to rewrite a lot of stuff for that. And people think that's a secret Targaryen being one of the Lannisters. Does he have to do something different in The Winds of Winter? And if so, how different from what the show is going to do does it have to be? No, I don't think he has to. I think it's already obvious differences that he's going to have in there that he's already had to use the word organically again. You know, we talked about it before, a whole lot of other people talked about it, that, you know, the Battle of the Bastards is really going to be Bowen Falls really still going to be Stannis against, uh, against Ramsay. And I was, again, thinking this last night, and maybe I'm thinking too much into military strategies and all that, but mm-hmm. if you go back to book one, when Eddard was first in King's Landing, he tells Callan, make sure Hallen Reed sets up Mo Kalen. Which she she never did, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Reason one, two, three, one, why she sucks. Uh, Rob had her covered sending whichever Glover and whichever Mormon mm-hmm. he sent with instructions and the rumored last will and testament of the former king in the north. Right. But you would just think that Roose Bolton, who's in the books, he's still alive. Yep. would have the experience and know how that he also, too, would want Mo Kalen guarded in case someone came up through from the south up to the north. So I cannot see the Vale army coming up through Mo Kalen without, without That's a good point. the Bolton army being, you know, the whole crap, the Vale army. So I still think that the army we see that comes in to save the day for, for Stannis yeah. is going to be John and the Wildlings coming in from the north to the south. And that's how John gets involved in the Battle of Winterfell. Assuming that he's uh, raised from the dead in, in the Song of Ice and Yes, Fire. at this point, he's going to be raised from the dead. A lot differently than the show. Because in the books, George won't forget about the Dire Wolves and forget about the warging. I'm trying to see uh, where the veil is in relation to. Uh, I mean, could I be wrong on that? Could they could they come up a different way where we're unguarded? But... Nah, unless they, unless they came from... See, right? Yeah. And they're not going to do that because the other problem with the veil is it's not like in the show. Littlefinger probably has the same game plan that he has that he had in the show, but it's not going to be something where Sansa Stark is going to have a whole lot of stake in saving Stannis. It worked in the show by changing quite a few storylines. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, using Sansa instead Dengaria. of 
Yeah, Elise Karstark. Uh, no, I'm sorry, Jane Poole. Jane yeah, Poole. Right, 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 right. Jane Co- Poole, yeah. Elise Karstark, who was really just like had a cameo in the first season of Game mm-hmm. of Thrones. She she wasn't in anything else. Yeah, unless they come, it wouldn't even make sense. And, you know, unless they come from. See, this battle is like so intriguing to me, and he wrote the battle. He wrote the Battle of Ice and the Battle of Fire, which we saw in Battle of the Bastards in season six. That was the Battle of Ice and Battle of Fire. Except, like you said before, Stannis is alive in A Song of Ice and Fire for the Battle of Ice. Battle of Fire seems pretty much the same, except there's no Tyrion and Jorah. They're actually encamped outside. Barristan Selmy's there. Barristan Selmy's alive and well, and Miss Sandy's a little a little girl. And uh, what's his face? Uh, your favorite character, the Unsullied. Wait, Ugh. Ay, ay, ay. He's not as important. Organically, I want to bring up another question. And I'm sure we talked sure. about this before and speculated before. When does Stannis order the death of Shireen? It's going to happen. It's. Yeah. Go- I believe the showrunner, as I said, that was one of the three twists. So it's going to happen. Whether he's there for it, seeing it himself as it in the show, or he's just going to order it done. When does that he happen? Okay- he okays it. Or does he okay? Hold on, hold on, I got a thought. I have a thought. Well, keep in mind, Melisandre, Shireen, and Stannis's wife. What, what is her name? Selyse. Stop. Selyse. Selyse Florent of House Florent, who declared for Renly. They're going to either through Ravens, Stannis on this battle. Well, maybe, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm speculating probably way off base here. But again, mm-hmm. I'm going to go back to what I've said probably podcast ago that Melisandre's going to sacrifice Shireen and thinking she's yeah. going to help Stannis win this war, but in fact, it's going to raise Jon Snow from the dead. So okay. she's, Shireen's going to die and be sacrificed, and that's going to raise Jon Snow. Okay. So yeah. how... I can't, how does it, I how can't does speculate. Happen? I can't really assume why Stannis would want it done. You know, when it's done. Well, the solution is in the pink letter, right? Because John read that letter in which Ramsay Bolton said. Yes. Wow. The, your, fault, your false king is dead. So, Melisandre, Solis, they think that Stannis is dead based on, on this news. Right. And then Jon Snow dies at the same time. Right, right. Melisandre's so bugging gonna out. they're going to sacrifice Shireen trying to raise Stannis, their Azor mm-hmm. High. And this is going to confirm... Yeah. That John's is or high because Jon Snow is going to be the one that's going to be risen from the dead. No, because Stannis doesn't need to be risen from the dead because Stannis is not dead. He ain't yet. dead. Beautiful. That works. But as far as the Battle of Ice. And I see John and the Wilding army going out south. Because John has to be, I mean, John will have to do something in this battle to be called King of the North. He's got to be there. Yes. Maybe Stannis dies on the, on the field. Maybe they do lose that battle and then. It is a situation like Battle of the Bastards where John marches on Winterfell. I didn't love how Benioff and Weiss adapted. Well, I mean, they didn't really adapt it. They kind of came up with it themselves. But I don't like how they they made the whole part of that narrative real quick and real convenient. I, I, I feel like it's John's return from the dead. I just don't think it was explored enough. Man to wolf to man again. The direwolves, that is going to play a big part in John's resurrection in the Winds of Winter. His last thought is, well, his last thought is sticking with the pointy end, but he does, does he say ghosts? He whispers ghosts. He, what, and and he whispers some people ghosts. have speculated that after the conversation with John and Melisandre, and Melisandre asks John where a ghost is, and John says, well, he's locked up, that Melisandre mm-hmm. goes to go get ghost, and John's mm-hmm. actually whispering ghosts because he sees ghosts, and at that point, that's when he walks into ghost. Well, I would think it'd be an immediate thing, and this is based on on the prologue chapter in Dance of Dragons, the Varamir Six Skins chapter, which is such an awesome chapter because you get all the repercussions of Stannis's attack against the Wildings, and you get in depth stuff about warging the Second Life, right, and setting it up. That keep that in mind. Mm-hmm. Yes, and that's why that chapter was there to function as a setup for this is what happens when a warg dies. They can go into the animal that they have a relationship with. I'm sure all of the Stark kids have the ability to warg, mm-hmm. some stronger than others. Really, really strong with Bran, obviously, because he's a green seer. Really strong with John, though he doesn't know how to use it, and he doesn't always understand 
his connection with Ghost. It's just his reality. That's what it's always been like with Ghost. As far as Sansa, you know, her direwolf was killed so early on, that's never explored. But we know that Arya Thank has... Thank you to Sansa on that. Yeah. But we know that Arya has really strong warging abilities also. She shoot Nymeria away, but she has those dreams. At least while she's in Westeros, she has the dreams where she is Nymeria. Mm-hmm. And there's the one chapter where Nymeria attacks... Not the Brotherhood Without Banners. The uh, Brave Companions. Yeah, the Brave Companions. Once they're defeated and, and they're scattering, Nymeria attacks and kills... I think she just attacks and kills one of them, a, a Dothraki. I forget the guy's name, but Nymeria kills him. And Arya dreams of that happening in A Storm of Swords. And she has a few of those dreams, but it stops when she goes to Essos. But while she's in Essos, while she is the blind girl, not that I gloss over the Arya chapters in Feast for Crows, but if you look at the Storm Arya- Storm of Swords and uh, Clash of Kings are so awesome. Amazing. So it's a big drop off, but there's still really good stuff going on there. While she's the blind girl, she's able to defeat the waif in a practice session because of that cat. Do you remember the cat? Mm Mm-hmm. There's a cat that's always around. She jumps into the cat and she sees through the cat. And that's how she defeats the waif. So Arya has really strong warging abilities. We know Bran does and Jon does. He just hasn't explored them yet. But he has that dream in A Clash of Kings when he's with the Halfhand, Corn Halfhand. And they're going up the mountain, moving through the pass to see what Mance Raider's doing. The reports that Mance Raider is amassing all of the wildlings into a host of 10,000 strong or, or, or 100,000 strong, whatever the, the number was. It was basically all of the wildlings. He has a dream where he's ghost and he sees all of these wildlings below the mountain and uh, what's his face attacks him, uh, attacks ghost. The, uh, yeah. They don't have Varimir six skins in Game of Thrones, but they have this other warg. I forget the fuck his name. Oral? Yeah. Whatever it was. He, he was played by the guy that played Dwight Schrute's character in the BBC office. The guy that was the model for mm-hmm. Dwight Schrute. He plays this guy in Game of Thrones. I think it's Oral. Oh, the, the, the book is like the saddest part of the book. I really thought Ghost is dead. Yeah, he attacks Ghost and John wakes up and he feels the pain that Ghost is in. And Orel was dead, I believe, by that point because Orel was with mm-hmm. Ygritte. And his second life was in that eagle. So they start talking about it there, their second life, how Orel's in that eagle now because he warged with that eagle. I think it was an eagle. Whatever the hell it was. Falcon, whatever the fuck yeah, it was. Yeah, eagle falcon. Yeah. It's one of the... Shit. I think it's one of the guys with corn half hand that makes a comment. You had a dream from Ghost's point of view. It wasn't a dream. You were inside a ghost. John is really strong. He just doesn't realize it. He doesn't know anything about working skills. And from there... I believe it's Faramir Six Skins. He also notices it inside of John's warging abilities and also comments how he's really strong. He just has no idea how to use it. And not it. only do they, in that prologue, give it away to pay attention about the second life, but they also give away in that second life that John should be a king because now that I should take the direwolf, that would be a second life fit for a king. So right. John's second yeah. life now, yeah. his first life is dead, and his second life he should be fit for a king. Yeah, that's why they call him Varamir Six Skins, because he had control over six animals, which is like, that's crazy. Like, a really good warg can do two animals, and Varamir had six. He had, like, he had like a bear, or whatever, whatever the hell he had. A couple of wolves, I believe. Not dire wolves, but wolves. So Varamir Six Skins is known as, as the strongest warg, and he actually took over, kind of like Bran does with Hodor, Varamir would take over other people. He did that with his master in that prologue. He remembers his childhood and whatever he did, his parents noticed the power within him. Keep in mind that they're beyond the wall. So these sort of things are, are, are more acceptable and explored more. They bring him to a known warg in the Wilding community and they let that warg raise Varamir so that he can teach him how to use his power. And Varamir learns from him. And this guy keeps saying, you, you have a relationship with the animals, but you got to respect it. You don't ever use his power to take over people, and in the end, Varamir takes him over. I forget how the guy dies, but Varamir is responsible for his mentor's death, but he also wargs into him. And Varamir was originally planning to warg into, he's with a, a, a woman, a wilding woman, an older woman, but he plans to warg into her, and she fights him out. I think she, like, bites her tongue off as they struggle within her, and it ends up that Varamir, not even like an eagle or anything, like it, just a bird that's passing by. At the last moment, he wargs into that animal. Point being... Ghost is going to play a role in John's resurrection of Winds of Winter. It's set up that way. 
it makes more sense that way. And the way they glossed over that entire warging storyline, I understand why they did it in Game of Thrones, but it hurts the explanation. It makes it, it, makes it more about Melisandre's abilities. Right, and it makes it so much, we, we have to keep on hearing these theories how John's a wit. You know, he's a fire wit. That's the latest one, he's a fire wit. And that's based on what George R. R. Martin said about comparing John to to Beric but Gondarian. He, he actually never even used it. He actually never actually came out and said it. People just assumed he was talking the same thing. He switched the subject to Beric because they're talking about John's death. And he said, well, look at Beric Dondarrion. He's not what he is. He's a, he's a fire wit. So then people just assumed he was talking about right. that John's right. a fire wit also. Yeah, he wasn't even saying in, in relation to he John. He was completely trying to switch the subject because he didn't want to talk about John Snow because he didn't yeah. want to give that away. If he's a fire wit that wants a sense of being his body, being a ghost, his conscious being a ghost. We know it's set up in the book that he will be in ghost. As far as we know, with resurrection in Westeros and Song of Ice and Fire, we know that whites are the dead resurrected and they're like a zombie, like a frozen zombie. It's ice and the cold and the dark that gives them power. Their eyes are blue, they're frozen, they move real slow. I, I think in Game of Thrones, they they move fast, they, they can run, but I don't recall anything in A Song of Ice and Fire in, in his books where they can move fast. They're resurrected dead bodies. They, they kind of lumber along like zombies. But on the opposite end of the spectrum, right, because it's all about balance. So if there's something on that end, Song of Ice and Fire, ice functioning as the metaphor for what powers the whites, it's got to be on the opposite end, the fire. So you have the character of Beric Dondarrion who is killed in in a Game of Thrones, it's reported that he's that he's killed, or at least it's reported in the Clash of Kings. But the event would have happened in a Game of Thrones, where it was a trap set for Ned Stark by Tywin mm-hmm. Lannister. But Ned was injured by Jaime Lannister. You know, Ned would have led that party. Tywin knows that Ned would have led that party, but he couldn't because the horse fell on him when his men were attacked by Jaime Lannister in the streets of King's Landing. So he sends Lord Beric Dondarrion instead. Even though they probably should have done this in Game of Thrones because the character of Loras Tyrell was established by that point and it would have added to his character. But in a Game of Thrones, in that scene where Ned is sitting a throne while Robert's out hunting on the hunting trip that would eventually mm-hmm. kill him, it's reported by people of the Riverlands that a man that looks a lot like the mountain that rides is destroying their villages, killing their people, raping their women. And Littlefinger's like, who do we know that that size? Littlefinger, like, egging Ned oh, on to, to start all oh, that, that war. That sounds like someone we know. Isn't the fish the sigil of your <laughs> wife's house? <laughs> but anyway, when Ned decides that it is Gregor Clegane and he's going to send a party out to capture him, Loris Tyrell jumps at the chance. And in front of the whole court, Loris Tyrell is like, Lord Stark, please send me. It'd be my mm-hmm. honor. Let me do this for King Robert. And Ned's looking at him, and, and he's a young kid, 16, 17 years old. No, not that young, but like 18, 19, right. whatever. Sir Loris Terrell, and Ned's looking at him, and he's like, this kid, he wants to do it for the glory. So I'm not I'm not sending him. Then that's why he chooses Lord Beric, because first off, Beric Dondarrion's a lord. Whereas Loris Terrell's a knight, the third son of, of Lord Mace Terrell. Of, of a powerful house. You don't want to, this kid dying, and all of a sudden the Tyrells going to be pissed off at how Stark. They can like, oh, this guy sent my son. That's part of it too, absolutely. To steal the deal, it was that he looks at this kid and like he looks at somebody that wants to go to battle for glory. Based off Ned's experiences in, in Robert's Rebellion and his knowledge of his own brother Brandon, who was probably more like Loras than he was like Ned. Like, I can't trust this kid to lead this party. I need a guy like Beric Dondarrion, who's a lord who understands what it's what it's like to rule over people. He'll be able to see things that this kid won't. He sends Lord Beric Dondarrion instead. And then Littlefinger makes the comment, it might have been wise for you to send Sir Loras. Now he's angry at you. Tyrells are a powerful house. Yeah, but they'd be more they'd be more upset at Ned if right. he sent Loras, who's like there. Actually, may, you know what? Maybe not because it would be a glorious death. Yeah, but 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 Loras for that house, they're like Jimmy Lannister. They're this is our future. Because the other the, yeah. other, the other guy is a, is a dimwit, right? I actually like Loras' brothers and, and I wish that they had been in the show. I get why they're not in the but show. But isn't one of them like injured or something? Am I, or am I mistaken yeah. that? There's Will, um, Willis Tyrell and, uh, I forget the other Tyrell's name, but the middle brother. But Loris is, is the uh, guy. Loris is, he's, he's the blue chipper. You know, Loris, yeah, Loris is the blue, the, chipper. He's the blue he's chipper. He's the blue yeah. chipper. And if Ned sends him out there and 
thinking Larry Kogan just slices him in half. How do you explain that to the Tyrells? Well, <laughs> well, that's that's one way to look at it. But also keep in mind, it would be on Tywin Lannister's orders that that happened. Right? So then the eventual merger of Tyrell and Lannister, the alliance that wins the War of the Five Kings, very unlikely to happen if Gregor Cogain killed Sir Loras. Good point. They could hold Ned responsible for that. Listen, you know, Stark Tyrell Alliance, Catelyn muses about that in one of her chapters. I think when she's visiting King Renly, she muses on Rob should have married uh, this young girl. That should have been an alliance for us. It's not reasonable, though, because of distances between the houses, especially as this war breaks out. But House Tyrell was the real true wild card in the War of the Five Kings. Once that alliance became a thing, that was it. The two wealthiest and two of the most powerful houses in Westeros, Lannister and Tyrell. But going back to Beric Dondarrion, <laughs> in a roundabout way, he's killed there, but I don't know why. What's the guy's name? The priest? Thoros. Thoros. I don't know why Thoros attempts to raise him, but I think he says he just he felt like he had to do it. And he gives him the kiss of life, which is, as far as I can tell, it's just like a crude form of CPR. Mm-hmm. The breath of life, kiss of life, or, or whatever it is. But he, he rises. Beric Dondarrion comes back and it's, and it's fire that's powering him or the metaphor for fire that's bringing his dead body back to life. And his conscience is, his mind is, is still there. It's not quite what it was, but it's still there. I don't know how many times Beric Dondarrion's six. killed. Six times he's killed or six times he's raised. Cause that would work with your seven, with the, with the se- and yeah. his last breath, his seventh life, he passes on to Catelyn Tully. To your girl. To keep that in mind, though, too, in the books, we, we talked before about Will George change things. You got to keep in mind, there's another change right there. Or it's just organically, you don't already know that Barry mm-hmm. is dead in the books. He's dead, mm-hmm. dead, dead. He's not coming back because he gave his last left to Catelyn Tully. And plus, it's, it's different for Barrick in the books because it, in the show, it's like a novelty. Like, yeah, I don't know why I do it, but I keep doing it. I keep coming back. I can't die. Even though I'm sure the Night King will kill him early on in season eight and that'll be it for him. In A Song of Ice and Fire, each time he's brought back, his mind is is further away. His mind is dying. So when the whites are, are raised, they don't recall their past life. Or they, they do. I'm mistaken. They do. Because the one white in A Game of Thrones, he knows where G.R. Yeah. Mormon's chambers mm-hmm. are. And he knows that he's in charge, so he tries to kill him. But it's like base brain power, you know, like a memory or maybe it's not. Maybe they're as sharp as Beric Dondarrion on his first resurrection, except that they don't have the motor function that the fire power gives to Beric. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. They're kind of lumbering around and, and they can't really speak, whereas Beric Dondarrion can. Maybe they have the same same brain power, but it, it seems that Beric Dondarrion is a lot smarter than a raised white. And I'm sure how long a person is dead also plays into where their brain power is upon resurrection. But each time Beric Dondarrion is raised he's a little bit further gone to the point where he's like i can picture my home i know i had a wife but for the life of me i can't remember her name can't remember what she looks like i don't know how to get to black haven i don't know how to get to my castle but i know i'm the lord of it i can kind of see it in my mind each time he's a little bit further gone and and that last time which we don't get except in story from thoros he sees catelyn tully and i think that if you believe in the lord of light R'hllor, maybe he's telling him to do that, but he decides that his resurrections have come to an end. He doesn't want this life anymore. And here's somebody who's probably worthy to lead the Brotherhood without banners because <laughs> she's a Stark, right? So she's going to be honorable, little this, little this yeah. you know. Um, she's angry. She's just been killed by the Lannisters in the phrase. So he decides to pass his power on to her. So he gives her the breath of life and she's just consumed by vengeance at that point. Anyway, Jon Snow is dead, so he's going to be raised by that power. Not by the kiss of life, but by fire, right? You if Melisandre is responsible for it, if it's Shireen being burned, that, that gives him that power back. The difference between him and Beric, here, here's my point, the difference between him and Beric, where Beric loses a, pe- a bit of his mind. Jon's mind's ghost. It's in ghost. So it's the That's warrior. the question I bring up to these people. Like, well, his mind yeah. is not lost, his mind's in ghost. He might come a little more animal like he might come a little more aggressive. Yes, yes, which explains his decision making in season six of Game of Thrones. He had to hang Ollie, he had to hang Sir Alistair because they betrayed their vows. They 
mutineered and, mm-hmm. and killed the Lord Commander. But it was rather aggressive for Jon Snow. He beheaded, uh, what's his face? Oh, what's um, his name? Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> How can we forget? Oh, my God. Yeah, this wouldn't been we have, uh, we, watching. We have, oh, holy crap. Shit. Hold on. Can't, we, can't, we can't not say his yeah, name. Yeah, this is... It's, gonna be, it's such an obvious one, too. Yeah. Janice Slint. Janice Slint. How do we yep. forget that? God, we're yeah. slipping. Uh, yeah, yeah, we really are, man. Getting old. John had to do that. Not that it's unjohn like That's that's Ned Stark-like. Sure, he, did, he didn't enjoy doing it, but... Well, he kind of did. Because he knew that this guy killed his father, was responsible for his father's death, somewhat. But yeah, John's going to come back and he's going to be... He's going to be more aggressive and animal-like because he's spent time in Ghost. If anything... Beric Dondarrion got not dumber with each. Josh should have some better instincts. Version 2.0, yeah. He'll have better instincts, sight, smell, hearing, because it's part of Ghost. I want to ask you a question, but before I forget, it's mm-hmm. definitely being set up. This is definitely going to be happening in the box. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's going to happen in the box. Now, when John meets Danny, they will fall in love and they will have a kid. It's being set mm-hmm. up. I and mean, Jorah Mormont said, give it back a long call to John. And I appreciate it, but keep it for you. Keep it for your kids. Watch over your kids with it. So it's setting up right. that they're going to have kids. Do you think a guy like Beric Dondarrion can have a kid? Do I think Beric Dondarrion? Yes. On his like second and third and fourth lives. No. I don't think that happens that way. Just That's where, no. it, that to me, is another difference. That John is going to be a capable human. He's going to be able to, you know, reproduce. And yeah, also, okay. too, notice how Melisandre, they even show they went away from it. Melisandre didn't give John the kiss of life. She just said a prayer. She didn't give him the kiss of life. Ah, shit. Do they have Thoros of Mer doing that to Beric in, in Game of Thrones? Like, yes. Did he say it was a kiss in life? Yes. Okay. So it's weird that they gloss over I'm not that, sure they I, said it was a kiss in life, but you saw him, you know, doing it. We should try and find that out because it would actually make more sense if they do away with the kiss of life altogether in Game of Thrones. And it's like some prayer to R'hllor that raises Lord Beric and then it's the same prayer that raises Jon. It's glossing over a lot of these key facts. And I understand why, obviously. It's so vital to John's resurrection, to John's character, to what John's character will be. If he is truly Azor Ahai returned or the things he does, who he becomes, resemble Azor Ahai, whatever it is, a lot of it will have to do with Ghost. And that's why Lord Beric Dondarrion is in the story. He survives that attack. He's wounded, but he begins leading the Brotherhood without banners. You can still have that storyline without the guy that keeps dying. There could be reports of him dying, but he's just really good at escaping. He's real lucky. You don't need to have him die and be resurrected. The reason why that character does that is to set up Jon Snow. Death is such a big part of A Song of Ice and Fire, but the resurrection is as well. The Whites, Lord Beric, it's all a setup for Jon. And Jon will warg into Ghost. I don't know if, if it'll be a Jon chapter or a Ghost chapter, but we'll get a point of view chapter of... John inside Ghost. We have to. We There's got to be something there. There, you know, definitely something. I know that George has had some trouble writing Melisandre chapters for the Winds of Winter, but those will be key chapters. Also, the Melisandre chapters because Davos isn't there. Davos is with the Manderleys, so it's Melisandre who's at the Wall mm-hmm. right now. I believe she's the only point of view at the Wall without John. Well, that's definitely yeah. one of the reasons why he gave a point of view chapter to Melisandre so he can have someone there for the time that John's not around to be in as a point of view at the wall. And it's interesting because what does she have? She has one point of view chapter? I think so, yeah. That was her first point of view chapter was one chapter in Dance of Dragons. It's an interesting chapter, but why? And explains it because she's got to be the point of view at the wall. And it's interesting because... She becomes a point of view chapter as a solution to George's problem. Who's going to be at the wall? If John's dead, quote unquote, how do we know what's going on at the wall? Melisandre's a point of view character now, so she'll tell us what's going on at the wall. Over in Marine, Danny's on her vision quest with Drogon. Mm-hmm. How do we know what's going on with Marine? Yeah, that's the he is the solution to that problem. It's just interesting that John and Daenerys. Two characters heading for not a confrontation, but a meeting that will change the story. They're both missing. And I know we've talked about this a long, long time ago. They're both on their own spirit quest in a sense. Daenerys going back to the Dothraki Sea, thought to be dead. Jon actually dead with Ghost. Danny with Drogon. The parallels are right there. They both have like a, at least narratively, they have almost like an avatar, like a standing character. 
to tell the story of what's happening in their absence, Barris and Selmy, Melisandre. It's interesting that he had the same problem for both characters and the same solution for both characters. It speaks to the bigger problem of just having point of view characters. As interesting as it is, as it is to read, you do run into these problems. Well, how do I explain what's going on over here? It makes sense then why it takes him so long to write these books. You combine those problems that he creates, which are good problems to have because you can find the solution and it will work very well once you have the solution. But you combine that with his procrastination. It's no wonder he takes so long to write these books. That's the idea of what John will be like when he's resurrected. But as far as how that plays into the Battle of Ice, the Battle of Ice is already starting. Bruce Bolton, he's a cunning dude. Dance with Dragons ends. He's not sending out Bolton men from Winterfell. <laughs> he's sending out the Mandarin. It's like, so, it's like so, so bastardly. But... The Manderleys will probably, I'm sure, they're not going to attack Stannis. I don't know how the timing is going to work with what Davos is doing, but Davos met with Wyman Manderley mm-hmm. and he said, I can't wait for that turn. I can't wait for that. It's got to be happening because Wyman Manderley went to Winterfell and he never travels. He traveled to Winterfell to see Ramsay Snow's wedding to you know, fake Arya, to Jane Poole, to recognize Roose as the Warden of the North. Wyman Manderley's there, so the, the turn has got to happen. The deal was set. Davos went to get Rickon. Wyman Manderley will declare for Stannis. Stannis isn't going to lose the opening skirmish with the Freys and the Manderleys. He'll win that. And then together with the Manderleys, march on Winterfell. Meanwhile, at the Wall, Melisandre thinks that Stannis is dead. No one's there to tell her otherwise. And now Jon Snow, who she's already beginning to see as special. If she still thinks Stannis is Azor High, hearing that he's dead will definitely make her think, I had it wrong. He's not Azor Ahai. Maybe we don't know the extent of Melisandre's powers. We get an idea in the TV show, but I don't think that's completely accurate to the book. So maybe she sees John in Ghost. She feels John within this animal, and she can do that. She decides to bring John back, and she knows that she has to burn somebody to do it. And unfortunately, it's it's Shireen, because Shireen is... What does she say? There's power in King's blood, mm-hmm. right? Well, Shireen is King's blood. She is. And if you don't recognize Stannis as King, King Bobby B, it's his niece. Stannis ain't going to stop her. She thinks Stannis is dead. <laughs> so <laughs> We'll just do this. It's a moot point now anyways. If he is yeah. dead, they're going to come up here and kill you anyway. So. And I'm sure getting Solis to agree to it's not going to be that difficult. <laughs> She's a fucking yeah. whack job. So they burn Shireen. I don't think Stannis would approve of it. I don't think he knows about it. They do it. John comes back. John doesn't like that Melisandre did that, obviously. Does he know that Melisandre did? Yeah, especially if he finds out that we killed a girl, like the 10 year old. He's not going to be happy. He's not going to be happy about that. I guess Stannis would function more like Davos did in the TV show as far as Melisandre. He'll want to kill Melisandre when he finds that out. I'm thinking maybe Stannis doesn't survive this battle. The initial battle with the phrase and the Manderley's coming for him, he'll survive that, and then they'll march on Winterfell. Maybe he is killed there. Maybe the pink letter is accurate. It does make sense that Jon Snow works as the Vale did in Game of Thrones. That makes sense. I just can't see an army coming up there and say no notification, like no horn going off, dude. Yeah. Watch your rear. <laughs> it looks like they're really close to Winterfell. He's like, all right, let's start building siege engines. It's like, dude, you're supposed to be like this tactical mastermind. What, what kind of campaign is this? March on Winterfell, you're like just winging it. I didn't like that about it. He's not even wearing a hat. <laughs> it's so cold. No one's wearing hats. <laughs> yeah, dude. It's not horrible, but when you think about what's really going on there, it People just doesn't work. People are wall and they're wearing clothes. Like, you freaking die from that cold. Yeah. It seems like it's a more interesting approach to the Battle of Ice than what Benioff and Weiss did. I totally understand why Benioff and Weiss did the Battle of Ice the way that they did it. it creates a lot of problems for Martin because we know how lethargic of a pace he has in his writing and also in his narrative. A lot of things for him to get done, not a lot of time, based on the pace of, of his other books. It makes more sense that there's three more books. It's like too much to get done in two books. I definitely fear that there's going to be a third book. <laughs> if he decides that there has to be a third book, it'll never get published. But I guess if there is, it'd be The Winds of Winter, Time for Wolves, A Dream of Spring. Yeah. I don't know. It's really, really too much stuff for him to be able to write. And that's just the battle of ice. On the other end, you get the same problem. Perhaps more so. Battle Marine, they did these two battles in one episode, which was an awesome episode. But they already established that Tyrion is with Daenerys. We don't even have their introduction yet. Right, they haven't even met yet. 
oh my god, oh my god, like he's got so much ground to cover. He's <laughs> three chapters that are just like, <laughs> all right, <laughs> this is what happens in the next <laughs> hundred days. <laughs> it's just cliff notes. <laughs> no wonder he's just writing these history books. It must be easier for him to write the history. It should be more confident in him as a writer. I mean, he can do it. He sold his property too early. Yeah. 2011 started airing or 2010, whatever it was. He sold the rights to it a couple years before that. It makes sense. He was almost done with the Dance of Dragons, or he thought he was. He's got the end of the story in mind. Surely, he'll have his series finished before the TV adaptation catches up to him. The entire show is caught up past him, will finish, and he hasn't gotten a book out. Technically, I guess he got a Dance of Dragons out, right? It was season one, then Dance of Dragons. But as you said, that was pretty much... It was pretty much done. Yeah. You look at Dance of Dragons, you think about everything that's got to get covered in the Winds of Winter, everything that's happened on the show. Then you look at chapters like the Quentin Martell chapters, at least with the with the Arian Martell chapters. She's a real interesting character, and it does kind of cover what Benioff and Weiss were hinting at with... Uh, not Elia. Um, Alaria. Alaria, yeah, whatever. The women coming to power, Dorne declaring for the Targaryens. So you could justify the Arian chapters, but the Quentin chapters, like, what was the point? It was four or five chapters, and all he did was work his way into Daenerys' inner circle, declare himself as there to honor a marriage pact between Sir Willem Darry and Prince Dorne Martell. Then he tries to <laughs> ride a dragon. He gets burned. You know, maybe that makes more sense if he's got more to play in the story, but I don't see that as being possible. If Quentin Martell's still alive, what's the point right. of that? I mean, like, because you already have Arians and you're trying to hook him up with Fagin, so, like, what does Quentin do? The Battle of the Sands. He's going to sell it to Ares and be Daenerys with Quentin versus Arion and, <laughs> and Fagin. The Martell Civil War takes place in the Winds of Winter. <laughs> they didn't do House Martell justice in Game of Thrones, but maybe it's more that George Martin put too much emphasis, unneeded emphasis. Much as we love Arian Martell, it's just not... Love her. Yeah. He cut out a lot of Feast for Crows to solve the problem of how much left he has to tell. And don't get me wrong, it's all good stuff. Even, listen, even the Brienne chapters, which are meandering, I do enjoy them. Definitely the worst part of Just seeing kind of like Frodo and Sam walking around aimlessly. Oh, look, we're back at the end. Yeah, and it's like a personal journey for Brienne, but we only get introduced to her as a point of view in A Feast for Crows. What does it serve? And ultimately, it just serves to bring Jamie to confront Lady Stoneheart. It's almost like it's more for Jamie. Like, what's going to happen there? What's going to happen there? That's, oh my God. I don't know, man. I think he'll survive it. Yeah, he will. But then what was the point of Lady Stoneheart? Right, is she going to die? Is Brienne going to die? And these are all good ideas, but how do they all function into the end? How does he tie them up? All of these plot lines. Is it set up that Lady Stoneheart is going to forgive Jamie Lannister? I mean, is that going to be kind of like an alt? Really, George? I don't think she's capable of it. Let's go back to what we are talking about with Beric for a second, right? Because Beric's, with each resurrection, he's, he's a little bit more removed. But Thor says, in regards to Lady Stoneheart, to Catelyn Tully Stark, that she was too far gone when mm-hmm. he brought her back. She'd been dead for too long. So it's just the base feelings she had when she died that are still there, which we know is revenge, anger, frustration. And that's what motivates her as a character. Where does that naturally go? And what is it saying about the balance between life and death, ice and fire? If you think of, honestly, we we don't even have a Night King in A Song of Ice and Fire. There is no yeah, knight king. knight's king. Right, the knight, the knight's king. But that's just a story of a lord commander of the Night's Watch. And that story ends with the Stark and Winterfell, I believe, joining forces with the king beyond the wall, marching on the night fort and putting an end to it. But the story doesn't say that the knight's king lived and went beyond the wall. So I don't know that the main antagonist on that side with the others, the White Walkers in Game of Thrones, there's been no leader pointed out. Their bodies have been described as almost like living ice, in a sense. And there's been no leader discussed among them. There's been very little discussed among them. So we don't know. We don't know if there even is going to be a leader character. I mean, you gotta imagine there has to be. I mean, there's gotta be some sort of one-on-one battle between whoever it is, you know, against the night. It just has to be. Yeah. 
So what did you think about that uh, latest theory I told you? Oh, my God. Horrible. Horrible. I can't even take it seriously like that. Like, is that guy being serious? Or is he like, John will get the dragon glass out of the Night's King. However, it won't kill the Night's King's. It won't kill the others. They're just going to go frantically crazy throughout the realm. So John only sees the only way he can do this if he puts the, you know, the control down is to put the dragon glass in his heart. Which is the story of Misa Misa. So, so this guy's saying John is Misa Misa? <laughs> That's stupid, dude. Even if, even if I was trying to come up with like a really bad theory, I wouldn't be able to come up with that. I don't even know why I clicked on it because a lot of these things now are just like clickbait articles and like yeah. stupid stuff. I don't want to mention the spoiler itself, but it makes less sense thinking about A Song of Ice and Fire because of everything that still has to happen. And I do forget that Benioff and Weiss are, are at a certain part far beyond where George R. R. Martin is and have eliminated a lot of the plots that George Martin has going. The plot lines in A Song of Ice and Fire, as of the end of Dance of Dragons. Beyond the Wall, you do have the others, we're assuming, marching south to the Wall. At Castle Black, Jon Snow's been killed by... Don't say the word. Don't, oh, don't say it. I hate that word. I hate that word. I hate what, it. Mutineers? I just hate... Why? I don't know. It's the mutineers. The, we got the mutineers. You know, it just seems so... Like parody. Yeah. yeah. Like parody. Well, he's betrayed by the, the upper echelon. The mutineers. Yeah, I guess they're that really mutineers because they're the upper echelon of, of uh, Nice Watch leadership, you know, outside the Lord Commander. It's a mutiny. John's stabbed to death, seemingly. Ghost is locked up. 1-1 one, one is, is killing the Queen's men. Melisandre is under the impression that Stannis is dead. And you go a little bit further south, Stannis is marching on Winterfell. And you're getting these chapters told... From the point of view of not Yara Greyjoy, Theon. Well, Theon, yeah, Theon's there now, but also his sister, um, Asha. You were getting told Winterfell through the point of view of Theon, but now you don't know what's going on in Winterfell. That should be interesting. Yeah, he's not directly there anymore, so you don't really know what's going on inside the head, maybe of a Ramsay Bolton. Well, that's why they gave the plan to send out the Manderleys in the phrase first. If they didn't beat Stannis, then send out the Bolton men, but. Roos's idea is that it's snowing so heavy and it's so hard for Stannis to travel. Roos's idea is that Manderleys and Frey should make short work of them. And even in, in the worst case scenario, they don't. Stannis isn't going to be able to finish the march on Winterfell because the snows are too heavy by that point. Well, so I'm just thinking right now, he's setting out the Manderleys and the Freys. Mm-hmm. Here's going to be the setup for the trap for the Boltons. The Manderleys are going to kill the Freys right there and then. And next thing you know, the Stannis is going to be like, Love this northern letter. Get the, his army will be bigger. That's a setup right there. So it's actually a mistake to put those two armies out there. Where if he would have like the Manleys, the Freys, and his own army out there, the Manleys wouldn't be able to do that because they'll be caved in. But if it's just the Manleys and the Freys, you know, they're all going to set up the war against the against Stannis, and all of a sudden, next thing you know, Manleys just going to turn on the freaking Freys and kill all the Freys. It's actually pretty ingenious. Yeah. Also, I forgot, Stannis knows what's up with the Karstark betrayal, because the Karstarks have declared for him for whatever reason, but they haven't really. They're really with the Boltons, and they're going to betray him, but he knows that because, oh, shit. Right, because of, uh, well, at least Karstark went to the wall. And yeah. And then he sent something down. And Jon Snow, yeah. So it's going to be a four-way battle royal. <laughs> it's a turn! It's a turn here! <laughs> it's, it's a double turn right there. <laughs> All right, so that's that's Winterfell in the north, pretty much. But they move to the Vale, and that's pretty complicated, too, because Sansa Stark has not told anybody she's Sansa Stark yet. She's still Elaine Stone. And Littlefinger is functioning as protector of the Vale. Robert Aaron's mm-hmm. his hand to the king, in, in a sense, the way Ned would have been protector of the realm. Littlefinger's in charge of the Vale, and he's gotten all of the other High Lords of the Vale to give him a year to make things right. And his plan is to marry Sansa to Harold Harding, who is the heir to Robert Aaron. I forget how, but he's some relation to John Aaron. Distant. Yeah, it's some like weird. Robert Aaron's Lord of the Vale and his heir is Harold Harding. He's going to marry Sansa to Harold Harding. Doing so, revealing her as Sansa Stark. The problem with that is that plan also relies on Tyrion being 
killed so that their marriage is null and void, even though it was never consummated. And it relies on Robert Aaron being killed or dying. Two not huge assumptions, but two leaps that Littlefinger will proactively work to make happen. He already did by framing Tyrion because he was in cahoots with the Queen of Thorns to frame Tyrion. So he's going to make an attempt on Robert Aaron. I don't even see how his plan... Like, I feel like Littlefinger at Winterfell at the end of season six, season seven, I don't think that he's going to get there in the books. I, I feel like he'll meet his demise in the Vale. But what do I know? Maybe making an attempt on, on Robert Aaron's... I, I don't know. But that's what's going on in the Vale. And then we go down to... At Moat Kaelin, we don't have a point of view chapters, but we know there's a Glover and there's a Mormon and there's letters to Helen Reed. And I'm sure maybe that plays into winning back Winterfell also. Jon Snow is probably named heir in Rob's will. And that'll probably play a part into him becoming king in the north once he's raised from the dead. There's Moat Kaelin and you go down to the Riverlands and yeah, you have the Jamie and Brienne who are rushing off to... What did she tell him? She told him that she found Sansa or she found Arya. Shit. She found one of the girls and she was in trouble. He ran off to save her. It's actually a real brave thing that he was doing. It's kind of similar to what he's doing at the end of season seven. It works with his actually because actually Cersei sends out word that he wants him to come back to King's Landing, and he says no, he wasn't going to do that. Kind of similar, but maybe not to that stem of importance that we've seen season seven. Having negotiated the surrender of, of River Run, Jamie Lannister offers peace to House Blackwood, the last of Rob Stark's allies still at arms, which Lord Titus Blackwood agrees to, giving one of his sons, Hoster. As a hostage, the Stark-Lannister war in the Riverlands is nominally over, but brigands holding no allegiance now roam most of the broken countryside, and Brendan the Blackfish Tully is still missing. He's still alive. Jamie sets about restoring order, and Brianna Tarth finds him and tells him that she found the missing Sansa Stark, who she claims is in danger from Sandor Clegane. So Jamie goes running off with her. And it's a trap, because at the end of Feast for Crows, Brienne decides to betray Jamie in order to save Podrick and... The other guy who I actually like, Sir uh, Heil Hunt, I think his name was. He's trying to get Brienne to marry him. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the Riverlands then. Brendan Tully's missing. Brotherhood without Bannis is turned heel, trying to kill Brienne of Tarth. So she brings Jamie into a trap. Oh, my God, I just don't know what's going to happen there. Yeah, it's pretty exciting stuff. He goes running off without backup, just following Brienne. And then in King's Landing, that's another one, man. And maybe it does work a lot like what Cersei does. That does make narrative sense. I thought Cersei done and buried at the end of A Dance with Dragons after her walk. But Varys, he's just a different character in, in A Song of Ice and Fire, and he's doing mm-hmm. everything that Quyburn was doing. Quyburn still makes Sir Robert Strong. Kevin Lannister's working as Hand to the King. Or no, he's, he, dead. Well, he's dead. At, yeah, he, he dies in the epilogue. But he was named, I think, Protector of the Realm, and Mace Tyrell is Hand to the King. I would think that once Cersei learns that Kevin Lannister is dead, she thinks it's the Tyrells, and she does... What she does in the TV show, I would think. But then Dorne, how does Arian Martell and Marcella Baratheon play into all this? And Dorne Martell, what am I missing? Am I missing? Oh, oh, yeah, Euron and his campaign on the Reach. I mean, we get the Winds of Winter sample chapter, which we talked about a while ago from the Drowned Priest chapter, Aaron Greyjoy chapter, and what Euron's trying to do in in the Reach, a huge blood sacrifice. I'm a firm believer that Euron has a big part to play in the end game of the Song of Ice and Fire. Those are all the plot lines that are going on. So if you look at Game of Thrones, like what did they use out of that? They mishmashed everything together, rightly so, to be able to finish their story. You know, they didn't want to do season nine, season 10, season 11. George R. R. Martin recently went on record saying that Game of Thrones could have gone on for 12, 13, 14 years or whatever he said. Yeah, it could have. You just couldn't do that. Right. But, you know, your meandering plot, while it's great to read, Great characters, storylines, world building. It just doesn't translate that well to TV. They've got the best part of what would be good TV. I'm sure you'll, you'll agree with me. Like plot lines from the books that didn't make it to TV that they should have done and probably could have done was a better relationship with the Starks and their direwolves or just better direwolves. <laughs> yeah. Have them appear at least. And Lady Stoneheart. I think Lady Stoneheart would have really transferred well television. But I'm sure there's something in how her story ends that they just felt wasn't important enough for TV. Right. That could be something that a lot of fans are thinking at. And thinking like, she's probably got, oh my gosh, she's got this huge role. And maybe they know that it's really kind of like a shaggy door. Like, think she's got a huge role, but she really doesn't. Yeah. You know, it could be nothing. 
that she does. Yeah. But in that case, then what is the function of her character as far as why George R. R. Martin put her there? I don't know. Honestly, it's got to be something to do with Jon Snow. Not character to character directly, but where her character is in regards to the opposite end of the spectrum in the ice and fire, life and death resurrection. Like we were talking about before, comparing Beric Tondarian and saying his resurrection is brought to us by R'hllor, powered by R'hllor, by fire. The resurrection of the Whites is brought to us by ice, not ice directly, but a metaphor for ice. The lifeless, cold dead is empowering that resurrection, whereas the fire warmth is empowering Beric Dondarrion's on opposite ends of the spectrum. Then what role does Catelyn Stark, Lady Stoneheart, where that character is, what's the opposite end for ice? You know what I'm saying? Like, is it the Night's King on one end and Lady Stoneheart on the other end as extremes for the life after death, the resurrection? George Martin puts these things in there generally. For a reason. Then he starts writing it and he just goes off on a tangent. But he puts those characters there for a reason to propel the narrative, to set you up for something down the road for that to make sense. Beric Dondarrion was put in so that it would make sense when Jon Snow's resurrected. And the Worgen was put there so it makes sense that Jon Snow comes back as a better Jon Snow, a more powerful Jon Snow. So why is Lady Stoneheart in this story at all? It's cool, but why is she there? It's the seventh time that Lord Beric dies, and so that number seven, and he's passing on to a character that was a major character in the first three volumes of A Song of Ice and Fire, and a Stark to boot. So why is she there? Like, I can't see Jamie and Brienne showing up and Jamie defeating her and killing her. Right. Honestly, that plot line and the Battle of Ice are what I'm most interested in. You know, the Battle of Fire, I can see, you know, Tyrion's, he's already planning to switch sides. They're with the Second Sons. Right, right, right. And he is the second son. He secures their support for Daenerys. They're being paid by the slave masters. And he convinces them to switch sides to Daenerys. So they will help out in the Battle of Fire. I'm sure that makes sense and leads to him meeting Daenerys. But he does that by giving out gold he doesn't have, assuming that he will get Casterly Rock when all is said and done. He signs it all over to each one of them. He pays them all this money he doesn't have, where if they switch sides, save Daenerys, go to Westeros, win that war, he gets Castle Rock, they all get paid a lot of gold. That'll be interesting, but it, you can kind of see how it gets there. It's really the Battle of Ice at Winterfell with Stannis and Shireen getting mm-hmm. burned and Jon Snow's resurrection. And Jaime and... Those are the ones where it's like, how are they going to do that? I, I, don't, I don't know how he's going to get from A to B. Anyway. As far as us, we should at some point finish Jorah Mormont. Maybe one more episode for that. And uh, I'm trying to think as far as prep for the final season of Game of Thrones. We're not going to go in depth as, as we did for the season seven return, obviously. Mm-hmm. We don't have to catch everybody up, obviously, on what's going on in Game of Thrones. But I think if we take the major characters and follow their through line through the series, maybe rank them which character had the best storyline, we could do a predictions episode. And as news comes out, we'll talk on it. Mm-hmm. And the news will start to heat up. Probably right around Christmas, it'll start to heat up. As far as Fire and Blood, I think it's November 14th it comes out. I'll purchase it. I'll have it read in, uh, within the week. If you want to talk on that, we could definitely do an episode on that. That's about it. You got anything else, John? Uh, got nothing. I don't think. All right. Thanks for listening. You can find us at Facebook.com slash The Promised Princes. We are on Twitter at Princess Promised. Read the Westerosi Companion, theprincesthatwerepromised.com. We are on Tumblr. We are on Instagram, but I just, I can't, I just can't do Which, it. Which, by the way, I, I just signed can't. up to the other day. Oh, right, yeah. on Instagram? All right. Well, all right. now that John's on, maybe uh, maybe we'll, we'll get cooking with the them. memes. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we should just do the brand, stick to the brand memes. Make some Jorah Mormont memes. You could hear The Princes That Were Promised on Apple Podcasts in the Google Play Store. SoundCloud, Stitcher. We are on, not Pandora. What the? F- what's the other one? Whatever it is. What is the other internet radio? Why don't? Why don't? Why did I want to say Firefox? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I guess you, you technically you can you can find us on Firefox. You know, it's just once you get on there, you gotta type in the Princes That Were Promised dot com. Settings, Spotify. That's what I meant to say. Spotify. We're on Spotify now. SoundCloud. Our YouTube channel is up, but you have to search for The Princes That Were Promised. We don't have enough 
subscribers yet to get an official youtube.com slash, you know, the promise princes or whatever, but we're working on it. And along those lines, subscribe to us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts from, whatever you do, subscribe to the princes that were promised, leave a review, tell a family member, tell a friend. We will speak with you guys very soon. Bum, 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 bum,